Mission Sunday. We really wanted to start uh, this morning with this video because of its focus on God, a beautiful focus on God. I wanted to be very clear here at this church that this church is about Him. It's about Him. It's not about us. We're not a big deal. God is a big deal. Amen? Amen. Uh, he is great. He's amazing. His gospel is so good. And yet because that's true, it deserves our excitement. Isn't that right? Because of the greatness of our God, because of the greatness of his gospel, that we should be amped about it. We should be leaning forward. The greatness of our God and of his gospel deserves and demands our ambitious effort, that we would lean forward and think big about how God would manifest himself amongst us and through us uh, to the world around us. And so that's why we have what we call Vision Sunday. It's just to evaluate. We, we don't want to become complacent. Okay? We don't want to become stagnant. Just sort of content to have a nice church. Yeah, I say that every year. This is a nice church. I love it. I love being here. I love being with you guys. Um, great people that are part of this family of faith. But we, we can't be content just to have a nice church, right? Because the gospel demands more of us. The gospel demands that we think outside of us. That, that we are leaning towards other people, leaning towards the lost. Uh, also leaning towards greater growth in our own hearts and lives. We have room to grow. Would you agree? Let's try that again. We have room to grow. All of us, right? We have room to grow. We do. Room to grow in our own relationship with God, room to grow in our own relationships with each other. So you're going to hear a lot today about the Word of God, that we need to be in it. It needs to be in us, but also community, in one another's lives, engaged in this vital community amongst us. This is why we pause every year in January to just consider who we are, evaluate who we are, and also continue to lean forward. What would God have for us? I think this is uh, reflected in a number of statements from the Apostle Paul, one of which is found in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, where Paul says this, Now to him who is able, to him who is able, this is about God and his work, he is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. Just pause right there and, and think with me that Paul here in this moment as he writes this, is thinking forward, right? God is able to do. He's able to do far more abundantly than all that we could ever ask or think. We can vision forward. We can lean forward. Obviously, these are just plans that we talk about. God directs steps. But even as we lean forward, we have no capacity to understand what God could do. What God could do in us and through us. This is what Paul is thinking about. He's able to do far more. According to the power at work within us, this clues us into the reality that God wants to use us. He wants to use us. To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God is able, my friends, to do far more I hope that you're excited about being on that journey with them. I know I am. I hope and pray that this church is in tune with God, desires to follow Him. God, what would you do with us, in us, and through us in this year? This is why we're here uh, this morning. Uh, but make no mistake, this is still a day of worship. It's a day of worship. We're going to sing, we're going to study the Word of God together. But it will be a little bit different this morning, a little bit more informal as we chat with you and chat with one another about. Uh, who we are as a church and where we're uh, seeking to go as God leads. So if I could, let me just begin this uh, whole service in prayer, and I would ask you to join me. God, thank you so much for your grace. We recognize, even in that video, that you are so great. Those vistas just reflect the beauty of your handiwork. Your word from John chapter 1 just reflects how great you are, God. Lord Jesus, we praise you that in the beginning, you existed. The Word was with God. The Word was God. We also praise you that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, you came here. You actually became human 
still fully God, but fully human. We praise you for that, and we thank you that you came here identifying with us, subjecting yourself before the law, but then totally fulfilling it, laying your life down as a sacrifice for sin, even though you never sinned. You didn't deserve to die. We praise you that you went there. And yet we also shout hallelujah this morning that you did not stay dead. You gloriously rose from the dead. You ascended and you have promised that you're coming back again. We're so thankful to be able to know you, to be invited into fellowship with you. And so I pray that you would be glorified this morning. I pray that this church would be about you, that we would meditate on you. And as a result, I pray that you would change us and you would change our world. In Jesus' name, amen. If you stand and prepare to sing this morning, I love the idea that we are intentional about what we're doing for the church, that we long to praise the King of Kings for who he is. He deserves our praise. He deserves us to take it seriously. I pray that you come prepared today to praise him. Let's sing all hail the power of Jesus' name.
cycle in heaven. God, you will just reign, and your reign will be perfect. Everyone will love it, and we will sing your praise. We will love to be able to be with you in person and see you for who you are. It's just amazing to think about, so thank you. Thank you for revealing yourself through your word. Thank you for giving us glimpses of your glory through your word. I pray that you would continue to enrich our hearts with it, ignite our minds with it, and I pray that you change our lives. God, as we continue to talk about your church and what we ought to be as a family of faith, I pray that you would help us to think clearly, I pray that you would help us to be excited about engaging with brothers and sisters amidst the difficulties, amidst the potential misunderstandings and messes that happen inside of community. I pray that you would help us to love it, help us to long for it, help us to engage it, and help us to, Father, just be quick to press in. For you are worthy. God, this is ultimately about you. And so we declare our dependence upon you in this moment as we talk about your church. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated at <coughs> this time. We're going to be able to watch a brief video that uh, highlights what took place at the Young Adult Retreat. This, this is just one of the ministries that is part of this church and uh, something that we want to present to you that you can be a part of and, uh, and we'll pray for. Uh, so last weekend, the Young Adults had a retreat and had a great time. And just so thankful for Brandon Heidi. I don't know if he uh, is in the room right now, so I said Brandon Heidi spent a, a ton of time putting together a couple of videos for us. And uh, so I uh, checked this one out uh, first, and then we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the church, who we are, and the ministries that are present. My name is Molly Newburn, and I am currently a junior at the university. In the last year that I've been attending Young Adults, I've really, really enjoyed being able to uh, go deeper and learning about the Lord with so many people from so many different walks of life um, and different age groups. I think the Young Adults ministry has really helped me because I'm at a point in my life where I am getting, through my education, a lot of secular worldview taught to me. And having the strong community of the young adults has really helped me to dive into the Word and see what the Lord says about those kind of things. 
um, and how to have a biblical worldview and live in the world, but not of the world. One thing that was really a takeaway and encouraging from this previous retreat is how close I think our group got. When you start, when you travel with someone or go into a retreat with people, you really start to get to know them. Um, I was super encouraged by our small group that we had. We broke up into separate small groups. I think we got to some really deep conversations and I got to know them really well. I think we're doing what Proverbs says is iron sharpens another, so another man sharpens another. I think we're truly doing that. We're encouraging one another towards Christ and we're practically building a way to how we can get closer to Christ in holiness. I really loved the Young Adults Retreat. I thought it was a great way to kind of get to see the women in life. Uh, being able to share a room with them, wake up with them, have meals with them, and just go about the day with them was really cool to see each other for more than a couple hours on a weeknight. Thinking more practically about holiness in the real world has really helped me meditate on my depravity as a human and what that means in my daily life. How I can see the sufficiency of Christ and His holiness imputed to me that then affects how I am at work, how I am at school, how I am around my roommates, um, how I am around my family. And it's really convicted me, but it's also encouraged me to pursue holiness more readily. Amen. Isn't that great? Exciting stuff. And uh, it's just exciting to see what uh, God is doing uh, in and through uh, people as uh, folks uh, surrender to what God might uh, use them to do, uh, to just pour into other people's lives. Uh, it happens. And uh, ministry takes place. And, and those testimonies, man, uh, what a blessing uh, to hear. So uh, what we're talking about right now is just a little bit of who we are as a church uh, even as we talked in our DNA series uh, last fall, a couple of things that we are seeking to be as a church are uh, authentic and a church that's on the move. A church that's authentic and a church that's on the move. Authentic in the sense that we want to be biblical. Uh, what, what does God's word have to say about what we should be, what we should look like? Uh, in that series, you might remember that we talked about from Matthew 16 and Matthew 28 that Christ must be at the center of any true church. An authentic church must have Christ at the center. He's the owner, he's the builder, he's the foundation of any true church. But also, understanding that his church, as Jesus himself defined it, his church is a community of people. It's a collective of people. It's not a building, it's not an edifice, it's not an organization right, or a denomination. Uh, his church is a community, it's a collective of people. But moreover, his church is on the move. You see that so clearly in Matthew 16, perhaps especially in Matthew 28, when Jesus says, go, church, go, make disciples of all nations. So we are to be about advancing the glory and gospel of Christ. But the question is, how do we do those things? How, how do we as a church um, maintain an authenticity that reflects what the Bible says we should be? How do we do that? And, and how do we continue to encourage one another to be on the move, growing together inwardly, upwardly, and also outwardly. How do we do that? Well, one of the ways in which we seek to chart our course is through five core values. So with that, I'm going to invite uh, a couple of the elders to come up, and we're going to engage in a little bit of an exercise here for 10 minutes. All right, so here's the deal. I told each one of them they have two minutes, two minutes to sort of summarize our core values. So Pastor Mark is going to take the first one, which is centered on the gospel, and he's got two minutes. And basically what I'm going to do, as five of our elders are going to summarize these core values, I'm going to sit back here and time them. <laughs> uh, there will be necessary consequences at our next elders meeting. If they go, I'm just kidding. Uh, but roughly 10 minutes, we'll see how they do, but roughly 10 minutes, we're going to summarize the core values, and, and as they talk about these things, I just want you to think, all right? Think about what the church should be. 
This is what we're seeking to be. We're not claiming we are all of these things perfectly, but these are things that are driving us forward um, to be an authentic church that reflects the Bible. So, Pastor Mark, take it away. Is the timer ready? Yeah, the timer's ready. <laughs> You're good. When someone accesses our homepage at heritagebiblelincoln.com, the first thing they see is big, bold script proclaiming a gospel-centered community. What does it mean to be centered on the gospel? It means that more than anything else, we want each and every person who comes into contact with heritage to hear, understand, and respond in genuine repentance and simple faith to God's gracious offer to save sinners through the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul speaks of this priority in a personal way when he writes that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. That's in Philippians 3. Being centered on the gospel also means we want to share this good news of God's grace with everyone around us. It's no accident that of the almost 100 uses of the word gospel in the New Testament, more than half have the word proclaim, preach, or testify right next to it. It's not an overstatement to say that the Apostle Paul was consumed with such a passion. Here's what he says in Acts 20, 24, talking to the Ephesian elders. I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel is God's good news through Jesus Christ, and it is the foundation and priority of Heritage Bible Church. May we be a community of people who know Him, are growing in Him, and are increasingly eager to tell others about Him. Amen. My that counts against your time. My my uh, <laughs> core, core belief is sound and worship. And I want to read several passages, and we're going to talk just a little bit about what it means to be sound and <coughs> what worship is. This is from Matthew chapter seven, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, "Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock." And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. God's word is a rock for our lives. It is solid, it is sure. Psalm 18 tells us the word of the Lord proves true. We can rest on this word. This is what is sound. Our worship is ultimately centered around this word. Everything that we do, where we get our gospel, is from this word. This is where we're told these truths about Jesus and ultimately the impact for our lives. And so, again, everything that we do oriented around our worship is going to be built on this word. But worship is not just singing, which we often think about. We think worship is the song time, and then it's done. The truth that Romans 12 tells us is this, that our bodies presented as living sacrifices is our reasonable worship. This is our reasonable worship, that we would present our lives, everything we do, my work, my time with family, corporately as we gather, when we give, when we serve, when we sing, when we listen to the Word and we place ourselves under it. This is worship. Amen. All of this is worship. And as Romans 12 again reminds us that all of this is ultimately based on what Mark just talked about. I beseech you brothers, why? Because of the mercies of God. This stems from the gospel. Our worship is never going to be real, it's never going to be sound if it is not ultimately flowing from the gospel. Appreciation for a love for a greater understanding of this glorious gospel. Lastly, I'm going to turn to Colossians chapter 3. 
And this speaks directly to our church context and a lot more of what we think of as worship. Colossians 3 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it take its home in you. And what happens when the word of Christ dwells in you richly? Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. When this word is what we're about, when this word has taken up residence in our hearts, we're going to sing, we're going to rejoice, we're going to worship, we're going to go from here, we're going to live lives in a pursuit of pleasing God because of the great mercy that he shows. My name is Ken. Jesus gave his disciples and us a new commandment in John 13, verses 34 and 35. I was drawn to that as I thought about being intentional in community this week. The commandment is this, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. We naturally love our families, um, but it's not so natural for us to love others that aren't like us, right? Um, that are different. It's supernatural, and that's kind of the point, um, that it's, it's not about us. Our common bond is in Jesus. Uh, that <coughs> brings us together. And he commands us to love one another like he loved us. We can't do it alone. We can only do that with his help and by intentionally getting close enough to each other to actually begin getting to know one another. The disciples modeled this um, as they were together so much, learning together, breaking bread, eating together, in the church, in each other's homes, in each other's lives, daily walking alongside each other. One of the best ways we can do that is to be a part of one of our small groups. I love hearing the gospel message together on Sunday mornings like this. But I look more forward to Sunday nights because I know our small groups getting together. And we're going to hang out. We're going to have some snacks. We're going to catch up with each other's lives and intentionally review and discuss and wrestle with what we've heard from God's word in the morning and really try to break it down together so we can apply what we're hearing and encourage one another as we walk together and as we cry together and as we laugh together. It's my favorite night of the week. Even if kids may or may not have been jumping off the ping pong table last week. <laughs> Still my favorite night. God made us to live in community with each other. In John 13, those verses proclaim that all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. How incredible is that? And how humbling. We, how we love each other is that important. I encourage you to check out a small group. Visit several um, see where you fit, and let's intentionally grow together in community. Committed to mission. So mission is defined as a vision or a quest that involves much effort, anticipates a desired outcome, a core purpose that remains unchanged over time. Praise God at Heritage Bible Church, our long-held mission and core purpose. Yes, the vision that guides us and the mission that we remain committed to has remained unchanged. First, to teach God's Word. You know, 2 Timothy 4 uh, tells us we're, we're told to preach God's Word, and then we're exhorted to hold firmly to it in 2 Corinthians 15, knowing that it's the knowledge of God through the teaching of His Word that dramatically changes and, it changes and impacts lives. This is a consistent legacy here at Heritage. Second, to share the good news of the saving gospel of Jesus Christ with the world. Romans 10 tells us that people must hear the gospel. Do you know that because of your faithful prayers and giving, people in over 25 countries around the world are hearing the saving gospel of Jesus Christ for the first time, perhaps even right at this moment? That is so exciting. It gives me goosebumps. Second, who has to share the gospel? Do you know... Um, how can we not be excited? Also, as a church, we are committed to coming beside and loving on the community of Havelock and the city of Lincoln and sharing the same gospel message that goes around the world with them right here at home. We are intentional in doing this in many ways, among them being Party in the Park, our annual VBS, Community Week, 
or annual outreach to the Havelock community that culminates in Family Fun Sunday. And soon the Havelock Coffee and Ice Cream Shop They'll be used as a heritage gateway to the Havelock community. To actually be in and among those in, in Havelock is going to be very exciting. So do you thank and praise God that one of our five core values here at Heritage is committed to mission? We're committed to unashamedly and uncompromisingly teaching God's word. We're committed to sharing the good news of the saving gospel of Jesus Christ with the world around us. We can be thankful and praise God together that this is our DNA, as we learned several months ago. This is our identity here at Heritage. Only because of God, we are a gospel-centered, Bible-believing, and Bible-teaching church. And praise God for that. We're doing that, and I'm an elder here as well, and I have a privilege of working with our youth. Um, our last core value is surrounded by grace. I grew up in a performance-driven culture with lots of Christians around me all the time and where you're tempted or tried to perform and come across as having it all together. Everything is fine or it's all good. No big struggles here. I don't have any prayer requests. God isn't impressed with our pretending. Grace is for those with the courage to admit limitation, brokenness, and dependence and need. God's grace frees us from having to hide, deny, or shift the blame as the gospel enables you and I to stare our sin in the face with humility and hope. Listen to this quote by Jim Cimbala where he says, God is attracted to weakness. He can't resist those who humbly and honestly admit how desperately they need him. Our weakness, in fact, makes room for his power and grace. It, it has to look like that vertically in our relationship with God as we understand and preach the gospel to ourselves daily. But it can also look and should look like that horizontally as we learn to surround each other with the same kind of grace that we have been shown. It's not easy for me to be transparent, to be vulnerable, to be open, completely honest, relational. And maybe you can relate to that. I know as church leaders, this can be a challenge of, uh, at times. I think we are sometimes put on a pedestal as the ones that have it all together, but we are messy too. We talk often as staff and elders of the importance of smelling like the sheep, and we need to be surrounded and experience an atmosphere of grace as well. This is about our sanctification. Uh, together in community as we were challenged to do last week by Thomas Anderson. I'm so thankful for small groups as I have witnessed and experienced this kind of sharing and caring and love and grace for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Amen. The more I'm preoccupied with loving others as Jesus has loved me, and surrounding others with grace, like our Savior has shown me, the less heart space I have for anger, resentment, revenge, bitterness, and judgment. Surrounded by grace, that's a core value that we have here at our church family. So let's grow together. That was fabulous. Uh, so thankful for those values. And those are the things that sort of shape uh, who we are and also the ministries that we are about. And so at this time, I invite you know, Pastor Mark to come up, and he's going to share with us a little bit more about ministries that are present here, how you can be involved in them to be ministered to, but also uh, how you can engage uh, in ministry yourself. And he's not timing this one. Okay. That's <laughs> good. Uh, this part of this service is really about you. Because this is the work of the ministry. Are you familiar with what it says in Ephesians 4? It says he gave some as apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teach teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. This is really what this is about. There are no ministries in this church apart from you and apart from the Holy Spirit of God working in you to effect change in the hearts and lives of people. So this is really about you. So as you see, uh, probably yeah, a rotating group of ministries, not exhaustive. It's just representative of things that go on in Heritage. 
You might think, you know, this is something I would like to be involved in. And if that's the case, make a note of it and uh, send your name to the church office or just contact one of us. We'd be happy to talk with you about more of what that may involve. Maybe you just want more information about it. We'd love to have you do that. So you're going to see several ministries up there. But I want to turn your attention to Colossians chapter 2, chapter 1 and 2. Just briefly, just turn there. We're not going to do an exposition or anything. I just want you to look at Colossians 1 and 2. I want to remind you what the goal of our ministry is. When I say our, this is our ministry by the grace of God, by His Holy Spirit, through the Word that He gives us, which is our food, that teaches us how to live and how to act with each other. You've heard several, several great verses this morning. This is really our goal. We agree upon this as leaders. It's Colossians 1. Uh, starting, let's start with verse 26. The mystery that has been hidden from the past ages and generations has now been made known to His saints, to whom God will to make it known. What is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Here's the key point. We proclaim Him, admonishing every person, teaching every person with all wisdom so that we may present everyone complete in Christ. That's the goal of these ministries right here. We want to present everyone complete in Christ. So as you look at the different things that this passage talks about, there's far more that we could cover here. You could have a series of messages on this. It says, in Christ, Colossians 2, 3, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It says in verse 6, it says, you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, now walk in Him like you received Him. It says in verse 7, you are being firmly rooted and built up in Him and established in your faith. It says in verse 9, for in Him, that is in this mystery from God, Christ, now revealed, all fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. It says in verse 10, In Him you have been made complete, positionally, even as we grow to become more like Him, as, as it gets closer to the time that we'll see Him as He is. It says at the latter part of verse 10, He is the head over all rule and authority. In verse 11 it says, In Him... You, were, you had a physical, uh, a non-physical circumcision. That is a circumcision of the heart, which tears away this heart of stone and gives me a heart of flesh that responds to God. It says in verse 12, we've been buried with Him. It says also in verse 12, we've been raised up with Him. And it goes on and on and on. The passage is full of what Christ is to us. This is why we want everyone to be completed Christ. So as I think about that, and I think about you doing the work of ministry, not just on location, not just by a schedule. Oh, it happens at 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights, or it happens at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. No, it happens spontaneously, organically, as we meet with each other, as we encourage each other with texts. There's all kinds of work of ministry. So what would it be like to, to take some of these ministries and to put these verses in them? What would it be like if our little children in the nursery and children's Sunday school and children's church what would it be like if we had this treasured opportunity to gently gain a little one's attention and tell him about Jesus Christ so that they might receive him? Amen. Colossians 2.6 What would it be like if we had Lighthouse kids? Lighthouse kids and they see the puppet shows and they have the games and they have the fun and then they're talking about Christ. What if the Lighthouse kids learned to Colossians 2.6 Walk in Him whom they have received. What would it be like in the youth ministry if you were involved and you had a chance to, Colossians 2, 7, firmly root and build up a young person in Christ? Whether it takes place on a Wednesday and I motion, motion over here because God willing, we will be renting this room over here for the youth in a very short amount of time, about a month or two. Praise God for that provision. What would it be like if in the women's ministry, Colossians 2, 7, they were always overflowing with gratitude? What would it be like if the men realized in Colossians 2, 10 that Jesus Christ is the head over all rule and authority and we can rest in His leadership even as we lead our families or our wives or those that God's given us authority to lead? What about in our corporate worship in Colossians 1, 12? And I jumped over here to the next chapter before. 
What if we were giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in life, knowing that we're going to go to get to be with Him in eternity? What if in our small groups, Colossians 3, 12 and 13, we actually put on a heart of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with each other and forgiving one another just as God in Christ has forgiven you? What if in our counseling ministry we realized that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and no one can take us captive by philosophy or empty deception? Colossians 2, 3 and verses 8 and 9. And speaking of counseling, we are so thankful and so blessed to have a friend of mine, Pastor Tom Schindler, who in just a moment after one more video is going to come up and share with us kind of a vision for counseling in our church. We want you to feel free to come. If you have a need, if you have a need to talk, you contact us. And we'll put you in touch and get a time schedule with Tom where you can talk with him about those needs. But also, we want to be trained. We want to be trained in some way. So, Lord willing, over the months and years, Lord willing ahead, we're going to have training for how we can care for people through godly biblical counsel for one another. So, in just a moment, Tom will come. I've known Tom for many years. I'm grateful to have him here on staff. I never had an idea that I'd work with him at a church. But here we are together. You watch this video, and then we'll ask Tom to come. I have been deeply blessed by Grief Share this year. In Grief Share, we had the video, and then we had the discussion, and then we had also the workbook, which um, all pr worked together to um, help us with the pain that we're feeling, help us to be encouraged that we're not the first ones to, to walk this path, and that God is there. In the course of years, I've lost two brothers to suicide, one more than 45 years ago and another one just three years ago. And sometimes it's, it's easy to suppress those kinds of things and really going through it and listening to those that have been through the difficulties of losing a loved one to suicide uh, has been a great help. When my parents recently passed away, I thought as a pastor's wife who had counseled many other people that I should know how to handle my own grief. Uh, so basically, all I did was just suppress it. But when it came time for me to say goodbye to my dear lifelong friends and for us to move here to Lincoln, all those losses just kind of overwhelmed me. Um, through Grief Share, I learned that it was necessary and right for me to grieve outwardly. I learned that there are a lot of other people that I can um, share with and who will share with me, and we understand one another's um, brand of sorrow. And I've learned that if I want to get through this grief, I need to process to be whole again. You probably think that there's not many people who understand the deep hurt that you're feeling. Well, after attending this group, we discovered people who understood our hurts and what we were going through. I think the one thing that I appreciate the most about Grief Share is that it helps me, especially at the age I am, to be a better friend, a better family member, in helping other people understand the grief they're going through. We're, we're blessed to have a program like this and uh, bringing us from hurt to healing and from grief and mourning to really the joy that the Lord wants us to have. As I look out over this group of people, I'm reminded of how diverse we are and how we all bring each week to a service like this, differing thoughts, differing opportunities, differing needs, differing burdens. I was deeply impacted by the statement of a friend who had a chance to minister for 10 years and became a lifelong friend. Dr. Warren Wearsby. I was a little surprised when he told me, he said, Tom, if I had my whole ministry to do over, you get a prolific ministry, author of 190 books, 
but every book in the Bible had a great ministry. But he said, if I have my ministry to do all over again, I would major on encouragement. Because I felt that everybody I ever met was carrying a burden. And I'll bet that's you this morning. That somehow you brought with you something that you may only share with a friend, a spouse, or a family member. But you might be staggering under the weight, or towing it along with you, or carrying it with you wherever you go. We want to be a church that majors on encouragement. And I want to help sponsor that in just a couple of ways. I want to make myself available to be an encourager. If you find yourself unable to deal with it yourself, you'd like a fresh perspective, you'd like an idea of where the resources are, where to look, I'd love to be a part of that. And you can do that by contacting the church office by phone, emailing me directly at tshimler at hpclincoln.com. But whatever it is, don't live 2021 by yourself without, number one, God's help and that of the burden-bearing encouragement of other believers in this church. And that kind of brings me to the, to the second thing I'm looking forward to in 2021. And that's an opportunity to help a lot of you realize what role you play, because I'm not in this by myself. Number one, I sure don't have all the answers. Most days I actually have more questions than answers. But when we do this together as a community, we can encourage, we can bear with, we can get through what God asks us to endure. So, in the next couple of months, we're gonna be inviting elders and uh, small group leaders, spouses, and uh, host families to get together and just understand a little bit more clearly what part they play in burden bearing and assisting mm -hmm. on the front line. Uh, maybe by September, we'll have an opportunity to uh, speak with those of you who may have an innate ability with others we have a great desire to help people individually, one-on-one, -on -one, to get some training, and we may launch a lay counseling ministry built upon the Word of God and the truth that transforms there and how we can dispense it more effectively. And so that's kind of what we're looking forward to in 2021. I'm so happy to be a part of that, to be a part of you, and I just hope that you'll take seriously the opportunity to not travel alone on this journey through life that God has called us to full of bumps and bruises and challenges. But certainly God is faithful. He'll help us to get through it together. Well, what a blessing. I'm so thankful for the brothers that I'm privileged to serve with. And uh, so thankful for what God is doing in this church. Uh, briefly before we dive back into the book of 1 John, I just want to give a little bit of a snapshot of our uh, vision forward and then we're just going to take an opportunity to pray uh, together about that. Uh, we are actually in year five of a five-year uh, vision that we launched some five years ago that had three major components to it. Uh, the major components were that we desired to mature in, communi in community. We had a goal uh, about five years ago or, uh, or so. This is our fifth year. We had a goal that we would love to see our small groups grow from eight at that time to 16, and uh, the percentage involvement from about 50% involvement to roughly 75% involvement. And we, we just really believe that that was a, a Godward, godly aim that we had. Uh, we haven't reached that yet. We still have another year to go. Uh, we have uh, some room for growth with regard to the number of small groups and also the percentage, but very excited to continue to press into that. Really feel like God is providing uh, leaders and more leaders are being raised up uh, to launch uh, new groups so that more people can engage in this uh, vital community. So we really believe that we have more room to grow in this area, uh, but we're making progress. And so I'm very excited about that. That was number one. The second one was with regard to increasing our presence missionally in our community, increasing our presence in Havelock, some of, something that we uh, recognized as we evaluated ourselves, was that we are often present, but not consistently present. Uh, so we do a number of events each year in the Havelock community, such as Family Fun Sunday, Community Week, Party at the Park. We've done our Easter service out there. Uh, but it always felt like we were just kind of showing up and leaving. Showing up and leaving. And so we've been asking God for a number of years for an opportunity to be more uh, uh, consistently present 
in our community. And we believe that God has provided that opportunity through this uh, coffee shop project. So we're pumped to be able to say that um, we're planning to open a coffee shop and ice cream parlor in Havelock in 2021. Pretty jacked about that. You'll hear more about that in the days to come. In fact, uh, in late February, we're going to be able to show you some really cool things that I can't show you today, but really cool things about the direction of that. Uh, but that, that is just on the horizon for us. So really excited about it and want to encourage you to uh, continue to pray with us about it. The third thing we uh, were asking God for is for the opportunity to plant another church. Uh, historically, it's been our vision here to not seek to grow to be a huge church in number, but rather to be a healthy church that plants other churches because we so believe in the community of faith here. Uh, so we've sought to do this, as you've known, uh, in the last couple of years, we've sought in ways to pursue a church plan, but God has closed the door on those. But we're asking God in 2021 for him to bring us someone to join our uh, team that we could send up to plan a church, uh, to birth another church in the coming uh, years. And so uh, that's still on our hearts. All of these things are on our hearts and on our minds and in our prayers. We want to invite you into those. Invite your input, but also, and perhaps primarily, invite your prayer. That you would pray that God would continue to lead us as we grow as a community. That more people would engage in this vital community in small groups. More people would be raised up into leadership in that way. But also, that God would bless our desired plans to launch a coffee shop and have a lot to have a consistent presence in our community. But then thirdly, that God would uh, lead us towards a potential church plant in the coming years. As we've said already in the service, these are all plans, right? These are all plans. And we know from Proverbs that God directs steps. And so we put all of these before God. God, would you help us in all these ministries that you just heard a bit of a snapshot tour, and all of these visions forward, we're asking that God would bless, that God would be, that God would guide. For without Him, it's just plants, right? Without His power and His grace, it's just plants. So I want to invite you to pray with us right now. I'm going to invite uh, Al Cordy to come and lead us in prayer. But I, I just want to encourage you to, right where you are, just bow your head and join us in prayer what God would have for us if we seek to advance his glory and his gospel right here. Pray with me. Father God, we, uh, we rejoice in you and how great you are. You are truly the sovereign God and we, we just lift up this church to you today. It's your people. This is your church. And we, we desire to glorify your name and we pray that you would just enable us to do that. Give us a passion for your word, a uh, burden for the lost. May the gospel go forth from us clearly and boldly. And truly, we have the only message of hope for this world. We yeah. have Jesus Christ. Help us to bring it and to bring it well. Help us to use the time and our, the talents that you have enabled us and incorporated in this body uh, to work out the ministry for Again, your glory. Father, we we just thank you that we can pursue you, and we pray we would pursue you uh, with uh, thirst for righteousness and holiness, that we would desire to see your name honored throughout the nations. Give us that. Help us to pursue you now. And we pray for your blessing on this year, that we would just be excited to see everything that you're going to accomplish in this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you would take your Bibles and go with me now to the book of 1st John. A little bit about what we're going to study in this year. The book of 1st John. When this COVID crisis hit and the shutdown occurred, all kinds of memes started popping up that highlighted for us how different people received that news. In specific, two different categories, the introverts and the extroverts. Perhaps you can call to mind 
uh, some of those means. But in general, uh, the actor birds were like, no, you know. Uh, it was like behind prison bars, you know, memes like that, people looking all haggard and stuff. There's no way I'm going to survive, right? That would be extrovert. But the introverts were like, this is fantastic, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is great. I've always longed for a shutdown like this. I don't have to be with people. And so <laughs> it sort of highlighted how people are very different. But after a while, as it continued on and on and on, even the introverts were like, Okay, I need to be with some peeps, right? Even the introverts were like, this is long enough. We need to get back to life as normal. And I think this is really indicative of how God made us. Isolation, ultimately, my friends, isolation isn't good. It's not how God intended for us to function. Not in isolation, but rather in community. Uh, even the CDC, which is very interesting, even the CDC acknowledges that this is perhaps the greatest risk to your health, just physical health. I found this on the CDC website. It's a recent article that said this, I quote, among those 50 and older, social isolation significantly increased a person's risk of premature death from all causes, including... 50%, think of this, 50% increased risk of dementia, 29% increased risk of heart disease, 32% increased risk of stroke, along with higher rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide. Fascinating. Physically, it affects us, this idea of isolation. But I would argue that the collateral damage that occurs Spiritually, when we are isolated and not together, not a collective, is far greater even than that. And I, think, I think this is why the Bible talks a lot about community. This is why the Bible talks a lot about fellowship. So I think we've seen this even in the book of 1 John already, in just one sermon. Uh, check out your text again, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. I won't read all of these verses, but... Just by way of reminder, remember that we saw last time the credible pointing to the incredible in a way that is critical for you and I. So John in this text reminded us that he was an eyewitness to Jesus. He was an eyewitness to who Jesus was, who Jesus is, what he did. John says, I saw him, I heard him, I touched him, and I'm telling you it's all real. He was Jesus, he was the God-man. He was fully God, and yet fully man. Clearly God. John says, I'm telling you, I saw him do things that only God could do. The craziest thing, I think John would say, the craziest thing is what he offers you. Note at verse 3, he offers fellowship. He offers fellowship. Check out your text. Let's read verses 3 and 4. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. It's fellowship, community. So notice with me, verse 3, the first of two parallel statements of intent. Okay? Two parallel statements of intent. First of all, intentions for fellowship. See in the language of verse 3, we proclaim also to you so that. These words communicate intent, don't they? This is the reason why I'm preaching. This is the reason why I'm proclaiming. So that you too may have fellowship with us. Fellowship with us. And indeed, he goes on to say, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. I think you can know with me what that fellowship is, even in the text. If you just think about it, and mentally begin to break it down, the language of with us and with the Father. What is fellowship? 
Fellowship is togetherness. It's companionship. It's the idea of being together in common. Sharing something in common. It's the perhaps very common Greek word koinonia. It's a very rich word that communicates about this idea of togetherness. It's about being in, okay? Being in the family. As I was studying this week, I pulled up um, a number of spots where this uh, term, this Greek term is used, and one of them was very interesting that I found kind of helpful for illustrative reasons this morning. It's found in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 9, and in that particular passage, uh, Paul is there talking about how he encountered in Jerusalem sort of the upper echelon of the apostles, Peter, James, and John, and how they were kind of scoping him out, and they were rightly skeptical. Right? They were rightly skeptical. Why? Because Paul, who was formerly Saul, was like enemy number one to Christianity. He hated Jesus, right? And he persecuted the Christians. But now suddenly he's been converted. And now he's come to Jerusalem to join the apostolic band. And they were like, really? Not quite sure about it. Now, track with me. I'm going somewhere with this. In that moment, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 9, as they sort of scope him out, they eventually, Paul says, extend to him the right hand of fellowship. The right hand of fellowship. It was indicative of being in. Right? You've made it in the group. I, I actually want to sort of demonstrate this physically. So I know my brother Andy will be cool with this. Andy, if you would stand up with me. Because every week we do one of these. Basically, if I can illustrate this uh, for you physically, I'm looking at Andy like, I'm not sure if we want you in, right? I'm not sure I'm kind of scoping him out. And then what do I do? When I decide, yeah, he's in, right? Like Peter, James, and John, Paul. Okay, we're going to welcome him. The right hand of fellowship is like this. <laughs> <laughs> Usually that's, that's the right hand. <laughs> That's the right hand of fellowship, and that's exactly how they did in the first century. <laughs> but the idea, you can see, is that it's an embrace. It's something that you see, you feel. This is fellowship. John says, this is what I'm proclaiming to you, so that you guys might have fellowship with us, and indeed, our fellowship is with God. Note that in the text. It's the idea of being together. It's sharing it. It's being in. It's being family. It's that kind of intimacy and embrace. But notice with me, I think you can see it even in the text. Well, we need to see it in the text. That this fellowship is first of all with God. That's the anchor. But it is also inclusive of we. Now, the way the text reads... John says, I'm inviting you into fellowship with us, and let's be clear, this fellowship that we share is with God. It's with God. Dustin, what's your point? My point is that in preaching the gospel, John is saying, I'm inviting you with this gospel message, I'm inviting you into fellowship with God that also includes the we. It's also us. We're together in fellowship with God. In other words, there's no true fellowship with God individually that doesn't involve a we. There's no such thing as a sort of isolated relationship with God, that it's purely individual. That's not how the Bible reads. Now, you each must have an individual relationship with God, but it never exists individually. Understand this. It is always existing in some sort of corporate manner. The universal expression of the body of Christ, all Christians everywhere at all times, but also a local expression that God has put you together with a family. So you see that here. God's design for fellowship. John is saying, I'm preaching this to you so that you can be home with us, and indeed our homes with God. So as I can illustrate it this way, 
Being at home with God is like being in a house. But in that house, there's lots of rooms, and you got lots of siblings. There's bunk beds everywhere. All right? Can you visualize that? Being at home with God, being in a house with God, but you always will have siblings. Always siblings. And in fact, this is part and parcel with our joy. That with me, verse 4. Know your text, verse 4. John is intent on fellowship. Verse 4 is intent on joy. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So I, I said a moment ago, notice the first of two parallel statements. These are parallel statements. You can see them. Again, the language of so that. First he says, I'm preaching to you so that you might enter into fellowship with us together with God. Then he follows that with, we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So that you and I would know what it is to have true delight, true gladness of heart. But also, that that joy would be complete. Now, what do you think he means by complete? Not that it's done. In fact, when we get to heaven, our joy is going to explode. What he means by completion here is the idea of fullness. The idea of fullness. Fullness of gladness, fullness of delight, fullness of satisfaction, as it can be known here. Uh, the, the language here is that of bubbling over. Okay? Not just a little bit of joy. This isn't why John is writing. Not just a teaspoon of joy. Or like a half a cup of joy. We're talking about like firmly pressed down a full cup of brown sugar. You know what I'm talking about? And you shove that all the way down into the cracks and everything and then you clean off the top. Actually what John's saying is it's coming off the top. It's that much of joy. That, that's why I'm writing to you guys. That our joy might be full in that sense. It's bubbling over. So the question is, who are we talking about? Whose joy are we talking about? And what is its source? Well, as we think about that, sort of breaking down this text exegetically, I would uh, say that the these things of verse 4, okay, the these things of verse 4 introduces us to everything that John is about to write, everything that exists in this letter as a whole. But I would also say that it is anchored in what he's just said. So I think what John is doing is he's summarizing ahead of time everything he's about to write and saying, I'm telling you guys, everything I'm about to write is going to work for your joy, for our joy collectively. But it's all really summarized and anchored in the previous verse, verse 3. How do we know that? I would say that to you in two ways. Number one, thematically, which I won't break down for you yet. We'll see that as we study the text. But you will, you will see it thematically. But also I think you see it in the language of power. Now with me these parallel statements. We prepare also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. With that language of us. And indeed our fellowship is with God. Us and our. Now, verse 4, we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. I think... John is continuing this thought as he introduces the letter. He's continuing this thought, which helps us to conclude that this fellowship that you and I are invited into with God is what leads to joy. So in case I lost you in that, just grab that. What, what are we talking about? We're talking about a joy that is rooted in, ultimately rooted in, fellowship with God and one another. What John is saying is, this fellowship that you're invited into, that's rooted in Christ and a right understanding of who he is, this fellowship you're invited into produces joy. It's simple. This fellowship produces incredible joy. So, what does that mean for us? What it means for us, in simple, is that true fellowship 
equates to joy. Genuine fellowship with God, being truly at home with God, in right relationship with Him, this leads to joy. But also, also, being at home with brothers and sisters, engaging in community with brothers and sisters, this, my friends, produces joy. So, even right here, can I say, don't you want this? Don't you desire this? That you would know this kind of joy, this kind of bubbling over joy in fellowship with God and in fellowship with brothers and sisters. My friends, I hope that you do. I hope that your heart longs for this. So as we move to application, let me just apply this specifically in three ways. I think textually there are three applications. Number one, I think we see in this John's pastoral joy. What kind of joy are we talking about? John's pastoral joy. Uh, later he will say in his letters, I have no greater joy than to know that my children walk in truth. I have no greater joy than to know to hear that my children walk in truth. And John here is referencing people that he has care over, people that he stands before God is responsible for. So John would say here, verse 4, that my joy is over the top when the people that I'm caring for know him and follow him. That gives me the most joy, the most satisfaction here on this planet. And I would say to you that the elders here share this burden. We want to say that to you. I want to say that to you personally. We share this burden. That our joy, our joy, really is ride with. It's not entirely riding upon, but ride with your security in God and your right relationship with one another. That's a joyful thing. Joyful thing for an elder, for someone who's watching over the flock of Jesus Christ. It's a burden. It really fuels our desire to step here every week and just proclaim the Word of God. Whatever it says, we're going to proclaim to you. Whenever we're in counsel with you to open up the Word of God, whatever it says, we're going to say it to you, even if it doesn't come across as you would like it. We're going to tell you the truth. That's our burden. That's our burden. To know that you have a relationship with God. And that you're walking in companionship with brothers and sisters. One of the reasons why we're so passionate about being gospel-centered is because we are so desirous that every single person that comes here would hear, at minimum, the good news at minimum, the good news of how they can know that they have a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. This is how John starts, isn't it? They want you to know this. This is why I'm proclaiming to you, so that you can have fellowship with God. And inside that fellowship is security. It's the ultimate security. Uh, the only real security you can have here on earth. So, John's pastoral joy, when he says our joy might be complete, Undoubtedly, he references his own pastoral role in their lives. Secondly, your joy in God. Your joy in God as an individual. There are going to be a lot of applications that come our way in the book of 1 John that will be applied individually. As we are hearers of the word of God as individuals. We hear it. And certainly this invitation to fellowship does extend individually. God has so composed his message to be heralded, heralded uh, publicly and then brought to bear in life through the Spirit of God. So as you hear the word of God this morning, perhaps the Spirit of God is working on you today. Perhaps the Spirit of God is, is drawing you to a place where you go, I don't know, but I want to. I don't know that my sin is covered, but I want to know. In fact, I am still carrying guilt, so I want to talk about it. Perhaps the Spirit of God is doing that with you right now. There will be individual applications for you that will lead, brother, sister, to your joy. For true joy, please hear me, true joy will be found in right relationship with God. It's a very simple statement. But man, could not be more true. 
your joy, the fullness of joy, this bubbling over joy, will happen for you, will be present for you when in right relationship with God, in right fellowship with God. This book will give us, give us ways to test that. How can, I, how can I deepen my fellowship and oneness with God so that I can know Him, so that I can know this kind of joy? Right? This is coming your way. I want to encourage you. Keep coming. Keep studying this book. But for those that are believers, can I just rehearse gospel truth with you for a moment? For those that are believers, to just make this point true, establish it as truth in your mind, is there a greater joy? Is there a greater joy than knowing that your sins have been forgiven, that you are guilt-free? Is there a greater joy than knowing you've been declared righteous by God and adopted into His very family? Is there a greater joy than that? Is there a greater joy than knowing your eternal destiny is secure? That no matter what happens here, you're fine. You are secure in God. And is there a greater joy than knowing that very soon you'll be with Him, seeing divinity and living color in person? Man, that's fullness of joy, is it not? Amen? Amen. What a blessing. Your joy in God. And then thirdly, our joy together. That our joy might be complete. Certainly John's pastoral joy, but also your individual joy in God. But thirdly and finally, but not last of necessity, it will be your joy in fellowship with brothers and sisters. In fellowship with those you share Christ in common with. This is a privilege that we have in Christ. It's a privilege that we have inside a church, inside a community, to have friends that you can share with, that you can share prayer requests with, that you can share struggles with, that get it. Yeah, I get that. May I have the same struggle? Right? Let's get together and pray. Right? That this is a benefit. Tremendous benefit of being a part of a family of faith. God has built the church, brothers and sisters, for your joy. It's not the only reason, but that is a byproduct. It's a byproduct. He's built the church for your joy. So let me encourage you guys. Press into it. Okay? Press into it. Not because that's just pastor speaking. Because we want more numbers. Because we want you to know joy. You hear my heart in that? We want you to experience joy. Tremendous joy in fellowship together. Now, you can tell that John got a lot of this from Jesus. Check out this text from John chapter 15. Then we can talk about all of John chapter 15 in this, but... No, just these two verses back to back. These things Jesus says. If you're looking at John 15, your Bible might have this in red. These are Jesus' words. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you. Jesus is talking about our relationship with him. That he's the vine. We are the branches. We must abide in him. And Jesus is saying, when you are, when you are attached, when you are abiding in the vine, this is joy. When you are in fellowship, in fellowship with me, joy is there. So he says, I've spoken this to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full, overflowing, okay? We might say that John is plagiarizing Jesus by not giving him credit for 1 John 1. Okay? This is just what Jesus said. That your joy would be overflowing, like cascading over the edges in fellowship with God. And Jesus says, and this is my command. Immediately Jesus' mind is not just this fellowship, but the way. 
This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Do this together, brothers and sisters. Be together. So God has not intended isolation for us. It's a killer. It's a killer. But the isolation can take place in two forms. You can isolate yourself from God. You could isolate yourself from God. You could choose to walk in sin and stiff arm God. Or you can accept the invitation to come into fellowship with Him, perhaps for the first time, to repent and believe upon Jesus as your Savior, to become a Christian, or as a Christian, as a Christian, to accept the invitation to fellowship, to engage in deep fellowship with God. This is joy. My friends, this is where joy exists. But you can also isolate from the body. Let me just encourage you, don't do that. Press in, in ways, press in. As you do, you will find joy there. You will find companionship there. So, to the question, how do I know that I'm in? How do I know that I'm in? And how can I tap into this joy? First John's going to answer those questions. So I want to encourage you to keep coming. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your grace. We need it. I'm so thankful for this family of faith. So thankful for the opportunity that we have to know you, to be in fellowship with you, and also to be in fellowship with one another. So I pray that you'd help us to make sense of this. I pray that you'd help each individual to accept this invitation to fellowship with you, but also that we as a collective would press in to fellowship with one another. God, increase our joy in 2021. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we close the song. Just praise God that he even cares about our joy, that he cares about our salvation, that he condescended, took on flesh, and ransomed us.
just praise you for the amazing, great God that you are. We thank you so much that you've called us to have fellowship with you and that we can have our joy complete in you. But we thank you so much also that you've called us to have fellowship in each other. And we praise you for that. We thank you and are excited for the vision for 2021 for this local body. And uh, God, we just pray that you would help us to take to heart what we hear. Uh, help us not to just uh, take it in as more knowledge. Uh, and I pray that we might uh, truly be light to those around us and that they may, because of what we are and what we show, being more like Christ, that they may glorify you. So God bless it today. I pray that you might help us uh, in this week to bring honor and glory to you in what we do. In Jesus' name, amen.